Thanks for joining us on the Joy News uh, channel. We're taking you straight to Parliament where the Finance Minister, Ken Furiata, is set to address the House. Don't forget the pensioners, uh, bondholders are also there waiting to catch up with him. Further exacerbated by heavy disruption in global supply chains. Mr. Speaker, amid the swirling chaos and darkened economic outlook, his Excellency President Nanado Dankwa Kufuado put together a comprehensive plan which was effectively executed, leading to relatively lower debt rates of some 1,400 compared to 53,000 in Africa and over 7 million globally, lower case counts, and the economy eking out a positive growth of 0.5% in 2020 compared to the many economies that went into recessions. However, this program came at huge fiscal costs. Government undertook major fiscal measures beyond what was programmed in the budget to accommodate the increased expenditure and the shortfalls in the revenue. Therefore, government, with the approval of Parliament, mobilized funds to address the following three key interventions. Finance direct COVID-19 intervention expenditures to protect lives and livelihoods. Support the funding gap in the budget occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic and its negative effects on revenue mobilization. And thirdly, address key structural weaknesses exposed by the pandemic. Government received significant assistance to mitigate the pandemic and its impact on the economy, which helped to reduce the fiscal burden. However, the drastic reduction in revenues, coupled with the high expenditure to contain the speed of the pandemic and to protect lives as well as livelihoods, resulted in a wider deficit of 14.7% of GDP in 2020 and 11.4% in 2021 that needed to be financed. Mr. Speaker, through these and other decisive measures, government has managed and continues to pay compensation for all public sector workers every month, keep the lights on, improve key infrastructure, and maintain security despite heightened and increasing risks. This is in far contrast to the rolling electricity blackouts, long queues of fuel stations, empty shelves in shell shops, and increased insurgent activities as reported elsewhere in Africa and even in the West. Mr. Speaker, Following these interventions, financing of government and liquidity on our domestic market has severely reduced. The access to the international capital market is closed to Ghana, whilst activity on our domestic bond market has slowed down significantly. Mr. Speaker, at this juncture, let me touch on the current ongoing debt restructuring exercise. Stemming from the considerable deterioration in the domestic and external sectors, government undertook an internal debt sustainability analysis, which defined public debt to include public, publicly guaranteed debt of the central government, partial non-guaranteed debt of state-owned enterprises, and expenditure areas. This analysis revealed that public debt exceeded 100% of our GDP, and debt servicing accounted for more than half of total government revenues and almost 70% of tax revenues. Arising from this considerable deterioration in the domestic and external sectors, government undertook its routine debt sustainability analysis in 2022, which revealed that public debt at general government level, including SOEs, ESLA, and DACHI, its present value terms was 103% of our GDP compared to the debt sustainability limit of 55% for countries with medium debt carrying capacity like Ghana. In addition, a standard debt service considered 29% of revenues compared to the 18% debt sustainability threshold. Mr. Speaker, provisional 2022 fiscal data also show that debt service comprising domestic interest payments, external interest payments, external debt amortization, and payment of domestic maturities not rolled over all amounted to 81.6 billion, constituting 85.1% of all revenues in 2022. This implies that a significant proportion of our revenues were used to service debt in 2022. Mr. Speaker, 
The picture becomes more dire when we include compensations of employees and transfers to statutory funds. Thus, debt service, compensation of employees, and transfers to statutory funds amounted to 144.3 billion Ghana cities, representing 150.4% of our revenues. Mr. Speaker, at this level, Ghana was assessed to be at a high risk of debt restraints and its debt classified as unsustainable. Let me clarify that the current state of our debt has a lot to do with the lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Russian and Ukraine war. This has been exacerbated by the high macroeconomic instability experienced in 2022, occasioned by downgrades by rating agencies, as well as the consequential pressures on government finances due to the actions of non-resident investors and the delayed passage of our revenue bills. Mr. Speaker, this situation is further compounded by the comparatively low levels of domestic revenue collected by government. In 2022, tax to GDP ratio was just about 12.6%, woefully below the Sub-Sahara Africa average of 18% and insufficient to meet pressures on the public purse. Mr. Speaker, following these developments, His Excellency the President, during his address to the nation on the economy on 31st October 2022, had to declare that the economy was in crisis. Government therefore outlined key strategies in the 2023 budget presented to this House on Thursday, 24th November 2022, to address the economic challenges. This was in line with the government's proactive application on 1st July 2022 for an IMF-supported program to restore macroeconomic stability, ensure debt sustainability, as well as social protection underpinned by key structural reforms. At the inspection of, inception of negotiations with the IMF, it was agreed that Ghana will have to address its economic challenges on three fronts, the impossible triangle, to embark, one, on fiscal consolidation, two, to undertake debt operations, and three, to secure financing assurances from development partners. On 12 December 2022, following three rounds of negotiations, interspersed of several virtual meetings, a staff-level agreement was reached on the reforms to be supported under a new three-year standard credit facility of approximately three billion US dollars. The staff level agreement required, among others, the completion of a comprehensive debt restructuring covering domestic and external debt in addition to fiscal consolidation efforts and other structural reforms. This is one of the fastest agreements for a country undertaking a debt restructuring exercise in achieving the SLA in December 2022. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Finance formally launched the Domestic Debt Exchange Program on 5th December 2022, seeking to restructure about 137 billion worth of government bonds and notes. As of December 2022, the total outstanding that eligible and non-eligible holders amounted to approximately 137 billion. Subsequent extensions of dates and payments of maturities meant that the remaining stock reduced from 137 billion to 230 billion of eligible and non-eligible holders. However, the eligible bonds as per the SJ memorandum meant an exclusion of pension funds and bonds that were subject to swap mechanisms for monetary and exchange rate policy operations. This then brought the eligible bonds for tendering to 97 billion 749 million 624,691 Ghana cities. Mr. Speaker, out of the total 97 billion 749 million 624,000 and 691 CDs eligible bonds for tendering, 
and 128 Ghana cities was successfully tendered. This accounted for about 85% of astounding eligible amounts meeting the target of 80% as expressed in the memorandum of exchange. Mr. Speaker, government is however mindful that the 82.9 billion bonds that were successfully tendered represent 64% of the astounding debt stock of 130 billion at the end of December 2022. Mr. Speaker, in addition, Though the external debt restructuring parameters are yet to be determined, government on 19th December 2022 also announced a suspension of all debt service payments for certain categories of external debt pending an orderly restructuring. Mr. Speaker, as I've indicated, the earlier debt exchange program was to alleviate the debt burden while minimizing the impact on investors and the financial sector. Participation in the program has always been, Mr. Speaker, voluntary. The details of the domestic debt exchange are outlined in the exchange memorandum and the subsequent amendments have been publicly available. The coverage of the exchange includes all locally issued bonds and notes of government, as well as ESLA PLC and Dachi PLC bonds. Based on the results of the audit of the public debt, government excluded treasury bills and pension funds from the exchange. Mr. Speaker, since the first announcement of the DDEP program on 5th December 2022, the government has continued to engage with multiple stakeholders on the program. It has been an intense exercise of balancing compassion with the unavoidable and difficult path to restoring our debt sustainability. As a result, Mr. Speaker, a number of amendments to the terms of the offer have taken place with the final extension deadline of 7 February 2023 and administrative extension of 14 February 2023. The various extensions were to allow government to incorporate the feedback and insights it received from the various stakeholders, including Council of State, the Pension Funds, Organized Labor, the Ghana Association of Bankers, MPRA, the Securities Industry Commission, Exchange Commission, National Insurance Commission, and the individual bondholders and retirees. The final terms of the DDEP was designed to address the specific concerns of the different categories of holders, including Category A, Collective investment schemes and natural persons below the age of 59, category B natural persons 59 years old or older, and general category holders representing all other holders except category A and B. The details of the results of participation rates are as follows. Category A holders issued 4,109 instructions and tendered an amount of 5.9 billion Ghana CDs. This represents 6.06% of the eligible bonds. Category B holders issued 1,340 instructions and tendered an amount of 423 million 12,028 Ghana CDs. This represents 0.43% of the eligible bonds. And general category holders issued 4.489 instructions and tendered an amount of 76,645,190,544 Ghana cities. This represents 78.41% of the eligible bonds. Mr. Speaker, government is mindful of the exchange's ramifications on the country's financial health. As a result, the government is developing several prudential measures to mitigate the potential impact on domestic creditors, considering the need to preserve financial stability. Billions of taxpayers' monies were used between 2017 and 2019 to rescue the financial sector. We have no intention, Mr. Speaker, to imperil that work, and we are determined to protect banks operating in Ghana and strengthen their capacity 
to finance the economic recovery and growth we see before us. The respective regulators have assessed the potential impact of the exchange on the financial sector, working together, Bank of Ghana, the Security and Exchange Commission, the National Insurance Commission, and the National Pensions Regulatory Authority are recalibrating their regulatory tools to accommodate the necessary forbearances for the respective sectors. In addition, Mr. Speaker, a financial stability fund is being established by government with the help of development partners to provide liquidity and solvency support to banks, pension funds, insurance companies, fund managers, and collective investment schemes to ensure that they are able to meet the obligations to their clients as they fall due. Mr. Speaker, government remains committed to the well-being and dignity of our senior citizens and pension pensioners. Indeed, it has personally, Mr. Speaker, caused me great distress as a number of our pensioners have picketed at the premises of the Ministry of Finance since Monday, February 6, 2023. I have already indicated in my press release, uh, Mr. Speaker, dated 14 February 2023, that government will honor their coupons, payments, and maturing principles, like all government bonds in line with government's fiscal commitments. Mr. Speaker, in seeking to understand the concerns of our senior citizens, I have met to them on three occasions, the most recent was yesterday, 15 February 2022, where I explained the terms of the new bonds. Mr. Speaker, I subsequently wrote to their convener, letting him know, Mr. Speaker, that all pensioners who did not participate in the bond offering are uh, exempted. Mr. Speaker, I pray that puts paid to the need for our senior citizens to pick it at the ministry. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank all those who helped in those discussions um, for this. Mr. Speaker, this significant milestone of the success of the domestic debt exchange program would also build momentum for external restructuring program, which has also commenced. As part of this progress, Ghana has officially asked its bilateral creditors for a debt treatment initiative under the G20 Common Framework. Consequently, Mr. Speaker, Ghana co-hosted a meeting with the Paris Club, including both Paris Club and non-Paris Club creditors on 10th January 2023. We reiterated the requests for expedited treatment under the Common Framework and presented our economic and fiscal outlook as well as the steps undertaken so far with the DDEP. Most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we made it known that we expect the Creditor Committee to be formed in an expeditious way to facilitate the program to ensure that we are able to go to the fund board in March. We have started the process of negotiating in good faith with our commercial creditors. Two preliminary discussions and exchange of information have started on a good footing with representative committees and advisors. The members have indicated their commitment to establish a creditor committee to assess Ghana's request for debt treatment under the common framework by end of February. 2023. We hope, Mr. Speaker, our commercial creditors will understand our desire to negotiate with our bilateral creditors softer terms than the ones we anticipate to propose to them, as a speedy process with the bilateral creditors is needed to pave the way for the discussion with private creditors. Mr. Speaker, we are also approaching major creditors like India and China to ensure that our discussions with the Paris Club is accelerated. 
Mr. Speaker, we've also negotiated discussions with the representative of our international bond holders and their advisors. Substantive discussions are due to start with them in the weeks to come. The government recognizes the continued importance of the DDEP in closing the financing gap and enabling the government to meet the debt sustainability target of 55% of debt to GDP in present value terms by 2028. Mr. Speaker, we have already indicated that these debt operations were a composite part of a broader government response strategy for addressing the current challenges while we continue to secure an IMF program to put confidence in the economy, we are complementing this by enhancing our domestic mobilization efforts. Mr. Speaker, as already stated in the House in November, we did lose access to the international capital markets at the beginning of 2022. At the same time, budget implementation was confronted with domestic financing challenges from the auctions as well as lower than estimated domestic revenue mobilization. This presented a very challenging macroeconomic environment during 2022, leading to a widened financing gap of the budget and therefore became necessary for the Bank of Ghana to fund shortfalls at the auction market to avoid this orderly default and prevent a deeper crisis. Mr. Speaker, it was necessary for the government to seek financing from the Bank of Ghana to augment its fiscal operations for the year. The Bank of Ghana last week concluded work on its financial accounts for 2022 and reports that the total overdraft extended to government for 2022 was $37.9 billion. Mr. Speaker, in line of Section 30, Clause 6 of the Bank of Ghana Act 2022, Axis 1-2, I'm using this platform to inform the legislature of the financing of the budget by the Bank of Ghana. The domestic debt exchange exercise and the Senate debt restructuring program will make such financing unnecessary going forward in 2023 and beyond. Mr. Speaker, all these efforts will be greatly enhanced if the income tax amendment bill, the excise duty and excise tax stamp amendment bills as well as the growth and sustainability levy bill, which are outstanding in this August House, could be prioritized and passed. Mr. Speaker, the passage of these bills will enable government to complete four of the five agreed prior actions in the staff level agreement since tariff adjustment by the PURC, publication of the Auditor General's report on COVID-19 spending, and onboarding of Get Fund, DACF, and road fund on the give miss have all been successfully completed. Mr. Speaker, I cannot emphasize enough the need to secure the board approval for our IMF program by the end of March 2023. I therefore entreat the House to prioritize approval of the outstanding revenue bills and the various concessional facilities so that we would ensure that the board meets successfully in March in Washington, and we also have the appropriate resources um, for growth from the facilities which are concessional. Mr. Speaker, let me take this opportunity to thank once again each and every one of you for your collective effort in passing the 2023 statement and the budget, 2023 budget statement and the finance bills that accompanied it. We are still counting on you for the passage of all the outstanding revenue bills which are necessary for effective budget implementation, as well as boosting our efforts at increasing our tax to GDP from less than 13% to the sub sahara average of 18%. Mr. Speaker, as the international and domestic bond markets are shut for the financing of government programs, we are relying on treasury bills and concessional loans as the primary sources of financing for the 2023 budget. We therefore, Mr. Speaker, call on this House to support the government's financing requests to ensure a smooth recovery from these economic challenges. Mr. Speaker, 
I want to assure you that I'll come back to this August House with the necessary fiscal adjustments after the debt operation is completed for your, complete, for your consideration and approval. On behalf of His Excellency the President, we wish to thank everyone who has tended and supported the Domestic Debt Exchange Program. It is a truly remarkable act of sacrifice in our nation's history. We thank those who heeded our clarion call and took the selfless patriotic decision to participate. Your names and deeds will never be forgotten. Your timely support is deeply appreciated. God bless you all. We also appreciate, Mr. Speaker, the concerns of those who may still be uncertain in these choices, and I trust that we can continue to engage, work together to meet, to reset the fundamental issues of the economy and reposition our economy. I'm confident that the program government has set out for this year, supported by Parliament, will get us out of the economic crisis that has besieged our economy since COVID-19 reached our shores back in March 2020. I am confident that with the conclusion of the domestic debt exchange program, we'll experience stability in the exchange rates, inflation and interest rate, bringing businesses and families some respite. Mr. Speaker, with the successful completion of the DDEP, we believe that with the sustained support of Ghanaians and this August House, we will recover from this economic crisis sooner rather than later, as indicated by His Excellency President Akufuado. I'm confident that the Lord who has begun this good work will carry it on to completion. We will therefore encourage honorable members to support the government's secure board approval for the IMF program to restore macroeconomic stability, ensure debt sustainability, as well as provide critical social protection for the benefit of Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, I thank you, the House and fellow Ghanaians, for the attention. God bless our homeland, Ghana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. members, let me remind you of the presence of a senior citizens with us in this house. We have our seniors, our parents, who mobilize under the group known as the Pensioner Bondholders Forum. They are led here by their convener, Dr. Edu Anane Anchi. And uh, supported by Mr. Philip Boabeng and Mr. Mr. Ango Bidiakun. There are other members here present, and they came to listen to the minister and also your good selves on this very important matter. We are also happily. I will, I will, in future, be considering your request for ministers to come and brief the House with a different eye. Well, I'm not even sure that many of you heard what the minister said. Many of you were rather engaged in 
personal conversations. You are not listening to the minister. It's not that the minister was not loud, but you are not listening. And I'm, I'm going to watch those of you going to make the contributions, the comments. We had students from the Tamale Technical University led by their tutors. They just left. They were the large group seated at my right side on the public gallery. And then we also have products of home school. I'm sure this is the first time some of you have heard home school. Education is not only the formal one you go to school, you can also be educated at home. So we have some of the products here with us. This is such an important topic that they all want to be part of. I think the strengths from the Tamil Technical University are back. They will all be listening and watching you make your comments. That's why I'm drawing your attention to their presence. This statement was admitted under Order 70. And for the avoidance of doubt, specifically 72, and I want to read it, because the whole nation is watching and listening to us. Order 72 says, a minister of state may make an announcement or a statement of government policy. Any such announcement or statement should be limited to facts which it is deemed necessary to make known to the House and should not be designed to provoke debate at this stage. Any member may comment briefly, subject to the same limitation. That is how your comments will be judged by me. I listen to the minister carefully and ask whether his statements were limited to only facts and designed not to provoke debate. I have my view on it. And I will also assess yours accordingly. So please, guided by the leaders, we agreed that we we'll take six from each side of the house, five ordinary members, and one leader. And they have submitted some names to me. So I'm going to be guided by those names. The first shot will come from the minority side. And from the list that I have, we'll start with Honorable Isaac Adungo. comments must be brief because we have only one hour for the comments and we have 12 of you so since they divide by 12 five minutes each it's, it's not me saying it it is standing orders honorable Isaac Adongo, you may start now. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, okay. Yes, minority leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the matter under consideration. It's a very serious matter of national concern. It will require members to contribute to such an important policy of state. So, Mr. Speaker, I appeal to you to allow members to speak for 10 minutes each. Mr. Speaker, this is the biggest national policy since I was born. And, and we cannot allow members only to speak for five minutes. So, Mr. Speaker, with your indulgence, if you can allow members to speak for 10 minutes each, 
and the leadership probably can do 15 or 20 minutes. Because this is extremely important, so I, I, I play with you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Deputy, Deputy Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, as members of Parliament, we have tools available to us to get information from government and also to attend to the needs of our constituents. One of said tools is questions. We can also file motions. And then when we file a motion, we debate them on a matter of national importance. We also have the other 72, which is for us as MPs to also propose some statements. And if you admit, we make such statements we deliver them on the floor, and members contribute. Mr. Speaker, on this occasion, the request by the House was for the Minister to come and brief us. The briefing is grounded on policy that has already been approved by this House. Yes, please, Mr. Speaker, one problem is that they won't take their time to listen. When we approved the fiscal policy of government, the budget, Now, Mr. Speaker, the minister has come to this house under Order 72. It requires us up to, of us to make brief comments. Honorable Atufosin, now I'm coming to you. Brief comments. Brief comments. Are you interested in working with the rules or you don't want us to work with the rules? Mr. Speaker says, let's go in accord with the rules of the House. In any event, in any event, you as a minority leader, if you want to do something more, there are other tools available. If you want to come by a motion to de debate and get some other information, you have that too. It's within the rules. Again, if you want to file a question, if after this engagement and you want to file a question as minority leader, it is part of your bona fides. So you can file as many urgent questions as possible for Mr. Speaker to consider. But Mr. Speaker, for you to say that because since you were born, you have not seen any matter of such national importance. Therefore, it is only by giving 10 minutes each that you would, have, you would be able to exhaust your point. Mr. Speaker, such an argument, such a submission for you to vary your orders, Mr. Speaker, a submission of this nature sit on stilts. Have to pay attention to me. I'm responding to your argument. Hey, don't let your backbencher distract you. Don't let your backbencher distract you. I'm making an argument. Listen. I'm using the rules to counter you. Listen. Mr. Speaker, you should pay attention. We are talking about the rules. Unless, unless Honorable Atu Fawson is not interested in parliamentary jurisprudence. If you say so, then say it into the record. We are going to work with the rules. You don't want it? So, Mr. Speaker, with respect, let's go by your direction, let's go by your ruling, and let's make progress. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, yes, minority from bench, um, who wants to speak? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what has Honorable Atufosin said? He's making an appeal to you. Mr. Speaker, what I heard the Deputy Majority Leader saying is that once we approve the economic policy, this is not the first time this is can be. Once we have not approved. Mr. Speaker, if I heard 
when we were doing, doing the budget, the minister said, this policy will be brought to this house. And he has come. Put that one aside. Mr. Speaker, today is the first time this house is being briefed with this debt exchange program. And you could see our fathers, our grandfathers, and our grandparents are here. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this Mr. Speaker, even the majority side, today is the first time the minister is briefing you. So, Mr. Speaker, if even you in government, you are being briefed for the first time, how much more we got in minority? Mr. Speaker, we are not in government, but the minority leader is just an immediate deputy finance minister. He has an input to make. We have a republic to build. So, he is just making an appeal that, Mr. Speaker, there are inputs I want to make in the policy brief the minister is giving. Due to that, I'm, at, I'm pleading with you to give 10 minutes. Is it out of place? No. This is not out of place. It's a simple request. So, Mr. Speaker, today is a special day. And Mr. Speaker, it took the magnanimity of the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs to invite leadership of this house into Koforibia for IMF program brief. The Minister for Finance has never briefed Parliament on the IMF brief. So, Mr. Speaker, we've been looking for him. Today, we've got him. Give 20 minutes each. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I heard the Deputy Majority Leader say, that Parliament has approved the debt restructuring program. Mr. Speaker, that is palpable lie. Mr. Speaker, I have with me the budget statement and economic policy of government. Mr. Speaker, I refer you to page 71. Page 71, paragraph 278. Mr. Speaker, it goes on to say that, Mr. Speaker, details of the debt operations program will be announced soon to the public and the investor community after the necessary engagement with all relevant stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, Parliament does not have the information our Minister responsible for finance has given to us today. This is the first time this August House has had the opportunity to have a bite on this matter. Mr. Speaker, again, the statement that the minister so far has given to the public is not known to us as a house. It's not known to us as a house. And so, Mr. Speaker, if the minister is before us, it is only fair that members of parliament will have at least 10 minutes each to speak to this matter. Mr. Speaker, I believe that as minority leader, I should be given 20 minutes minimum. 20 minutes minimum to respond to some of the concerns that the minister has raised. Mr. Speaker, this is a major threat to our economy. So I appeal to you to grant us that opportunity so that we can debate this or make comment appropriately. And let him not create impression that brief comment means speak for two seconds. My brief comment is a minimum of 20 minutes for, for your information. Yes, please. Mr. Speaker. Deputy Majority Leader, yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Mr. Speaker, Order 72. I will read first Order 72 and then come to 72 as well. Mr. Speaker, 72 reads, a minister of state may make an announcement or a statement of government policy. Any such announcement or statement should be limited to facts which it is deemed necessary to make known to the House and should not be designed to provoke debate at this stage. Any member may comment briefly 
subject to the same limitation. Mr. Speaker, the ordinary meaning of briefly is not 20 minutes as the minority leader wants her to do. Mr. Speaker, if you come to 72, by the indulgence of the House and leave of Mr. Speaker, a member may at time appointed for statement under the 53 explain a matter of personal nature or make a statement on a matter of urgent public importance. Any statement other than a personal statement may be commented upon by other members for a limited duration of not exceeding one hour. The terms of any such proposed statement shall first be submitted to Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, an interpretation of this provision has long been given by you that the terms of 72, that is the time period within which to discuss or comment on this matter, would be applicable mutatis mutandis to the provisions of 72. That already has been determined. Mr. Speaker, I have again, I would again entreat the minority leader that if indeed they have some other tools that they want to rely on, they should rely on it. And they should not, Mr. Speaker, attempt to hoodwink this house. Mr. Speaker, we approved the budget of 2023. And whatever session that he read did not talk about the minister coming back here for an approval for debt exchange program. I was expecting him to have said so, but he rather chose to say what I had said amounted to a so-called palpable lie. It is not so. Maybe you can say palpable falsehood. But you know, I will not, I will not. I will. He knows, he knows, he knows, he knows that I will not mislead this house. So far, every submission he has made is outside of this standing orders. That's what you've done. And my reliance on the budget of 2023, on all fours, can never be false. What you quoted, I to force him, what you quoted in the budget. <laughs> My respected minority leader, Mr. Speaker, what he said did not talk about approval by this house. The minister said he would engage stakeholders and subject to that, we approved it. Mr. Speaker, that is why when we asked of him to come and brief us, he's come to brief us. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Atu Fawcett, the minority leader, and his colleagues, all this while, never took any step as a minority. They never took any step to attend to the concerns of the Ghanaian people. The minister has come to brief us, and you want to get an impression as though the minister has abandoned his responsibility. Why didn't you file a question? Why didn't you file a motion? If you are minded to get more information, what are you doing as a member of parliament? He has briefed us. He is going by the terms of our standing orders. And Mr. Speaker has been given his ruling. Let's respect that and move on, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, Honourable members, I think enough is enough. I definitely need your inputs to be able to manage the House, but our rules are very clear. This is a statement on government policy, and Order 72 is very clear on it. The comments should be brief. The House can at any time come using other tools, particularly a motion, to debate this matter and to take a position and advise government on it. I am ever ready to admit such a motion.
for debate by the House. You give me an indication as to what is going to happen. Already you started debating, even though you are to make comments. You started debating the matter. But after listening to you, I will not be able to grant 10 minutes. But I will add at least some three minutes. So eight minutes each. I will stick to the eight minutes. I will stick to the eight minutes per person. The leaders will not get the 20 minutes as requested. I think the leaders, to be fair to them, I'll give them 15. 15 minutes each. That should be sufficient for the House. We will definitely do justice to it, particularly so as we have the senior citizens with us. You know that they've been picketing for some days now. So it's a very crucial matter to the nation and to some individuals in this country. So please, Honorable Isaac Adungo, take this into consideration. But I want to plead with Thank members. Thank you very much. Please, yeah, right, let's, let's use parliamentary language. Not the language of debates in a chop bar or marketplace. Parliamentary language. So please, Honorable Isaac Adungo, you may start. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I feel very sad this morning. Oh. Not just because we've compelled our senior citizens who I, have served I, I, our I, I, country I, faithfully, have worked so hard to accumulate their pensions, and when we are in crisis, the vulnerable are the ones we prioritize. They are not the ones who take their money. But unfortunately, today, they are the ones we are taking their money and I don't know who we are going to use those monies to serve. But Mr. Speaker, are we still a proud nation? <laughs> Have we suddenly no more a proud nation that we are all over the place begging people who borrowed money from and telling them we can't pay them and there are no consequences for this? Mr. Speaker, next time somebody serves in public office and tells you I don't want to be paid, you should be very careful. You should be extremely careful because free things are expensive. And it is an example of what we are experiencing today. Mr. Speaker, if managing an economy is all about collecting people's monies in loans, celebrating with cake and fish, and in the end run the economy into a ditch, and refuse to pay them and use that to create economic stability, then we must as well outsource this country to an intel artificial intelligence so they manage this economy for us. Because the management of an economy is a lot more than that. Mr. Speaker, we are in this house. When they came trying to find different vehicles to hide our public debt, they came here and said that you can take $1.5 billion even without a balance sheet and it will not be a government of Ghana debt. They came here and said, Esther PLC can take almost 10 billion Ghana cities and it is not public debt. They came here and said, they are bringing butter to build our roads in Sino Hydro. In the 21st century, they were doing for Enchine, Bejimoko, in Ghana. <laughs> Bring pepper and collect some butter. How can this group of people that call themselves property-owning Democrats are the ones collecting people's properties? So when they come telling you we are property owning Democrats, think twice. They will come after your property. They will come after your savings. Mr. Speaker, they will come and destroy your banking sector. We are taking 83 billion, and the impact is that the banking sector is losing in present value terms 41 billion Ghana cities. How do you expect a banking sector that is almost capitalized at 30 billion to survive 41 billion? So, have you solved the problem? 
you would rather transfer the problem from the government to destroy our banking sector. Mr. Speaker, how come the Bank of Ghana that is supposed to regulate our banks was sleeping when the people were investing all their money in government toxic assets? We have a simple principle of single obligor limits. It is a law that says that you shouldn't ever expose yourself to one person. It turned out that 75% of all the monies in the banking sector was in government bonds. Government, 71% of government domestic bonds were in the hands of these people. And the Bank of Ghana was watching on. Mr. Speaker, our pension funds, the National Pension Regulatory Authority said, go and risk 85% of your money on toxic government bonds. Mr. Speaker, where does that happen? And today, today, we are here with this boring and appalling statement. Mr. Speaker, we are not angry enough. As a country, we are not angry enough. This cannot happen to anybody. And yet, you are wasting our money, you are taking our money, and you are here reading this boring statement to us. Mr. Speaker, this is not a joke. And you are even quoting the Bible. Which of the Bibles are you quoting? In quoting the Bible in taking our money, in making us poor, in denying the poor pensioner his money, and you still are quoting the Bible. It is the reason some of us don't go to church, because in the end, this is what we get. <laughs> this is what we get. Mr. Speaker, this matter, I want to make an appeal to you to refer this matter back to the Finance Committee for proper oversight. The Bank of Ghana must come to explain to her how they allow the banking sector to help itself. The pensioners must come and explain to us. Mr. Speaker, the Ghana Amalgamated Trust must come to explain to us. Mr. Speaker, as we speak today, the Bank of Ghana is claiming it is going to throw $15 billion at this, pro at this point. Have we approved any $15 billion? They must come and explain to us how they are getting that money. Mr. Speaker, ever since Honourable this Honourable government has due office... Honourable Members, just focus on the statement. Mr. Speaker, it's a statement. It is about our public debt, and it's about who gave us the money. It's the banking sector that gave us the money, and we knew, with all the rating agencies downgrading us, that it was going to crash, and the regulator was watching them until they crash. That is about the deal. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister is required by law under the Public Financial Management Act not to allow us to meet this problem. He is supposed every year in May when he's presenting the fiscal strategy document to cabinet for approval to accompany it with the, the, the debt sustainability analysis so that we are not caught by surprise. Is it the case that he's not been developing the annual debt sustainability report? Is it the case that he has ignored the findings in those reports? He is supposed to present fiscal uh, risk analysis to, to cabinet. Is it the case that he's not been doing it? How come we are suddenly surprised and we are losing our money? Mr. Speaker, how are we going to convince any individual to trust in the state, to give one penny to the state? We were taught in school, Mr. Speaker, that government debts are a sweet. And of Uriata and his people are now saying you will lie. So we should unlearn all that we learned in school because government debt now is more riskier than lending to Adongo. <laughs> it is more riskier than lending to Adongo. So how do we now go back to reconsider the thinking of finance? That when you give money to government, you can't sleep peacefully. That when you work and you take your pension lump sum and you decide to give to government and live on your coupons, please, you are naked because you will go hungry and you can't buy your medicine. And we are proud to come and stand here and be quoting the Bible in telling this Mr. Page. How is that possible? Mr. Speaker, there must be consequences. There must be consequences. People cannot destroy our livelihood. People cannot ruin us. And when you ask them to leave their office, they say they will move. A job that we are not paying you, you are not ready to resign. And every day you are giving us one funeral after the other. How can we always be crying because you are a finance minister? Mr. Speaker, this matter must be properly investigated by this House. And I appeal to you not to end this matter today by this uh, route that it came, and that we must have a proper process to provide oversight and give the people of Ghana the assurance that their monies cannot just go in vain. And, Mr. Speaker, it cannot be by the stroke of pen of a so-called finance minister. That should never happen, Mr. Speaker. And I want to call on the finance minister 
to resign today by a public announcement here. Resign. You cannot be proud of this achievement. You went and told the investors in Europe.